and we can begin. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Magda. And thank you, Melissa, for joining us tonight. Uh, Melissa, actually, my first question uh, to you is, can you understand why a lot of us are tuning in tonight and we're really very interested in hearing what you have to say? <laughs> Um, there are, there's so many angles, uh, I, a loaded question. <laughs> I'm, I'm used to being on zoom calls where I am not the, uh, the, the du jour. Uh -huh. Um, and it's so funny to think that, um, yes, yeah, so that people are here to hear me speak. Cause I'm usually hanging out and listening to other people speak. Um, I think the legacy of my parents, um, is is broad and and worthy of you know worthy of thought and i feel as though a little bit as though this is a terrible thing to say as though it's it's disappeared faster than i thought it would in some in some ways and so i think that any you know anything we can do that it's the legacy of you know philanthropy and activism and you know, arts creation and supporting young people to create art and all, you know, all sorts of things. I think um, that, you know, that deserves, that deserves mention. Um, so. But, but I, I, as a historian, I, I, I would want to disagree with you a little bit. I think your parents' place in American films is very secure. And I think a lot of their work will be remembered uh, with great respect for many years to come. All of us historians at the moment are facing this battle of, will the culture that we care about be canceled in the name of current agitation and unrest? So that's an issue. Will everything from the past be seen in a different way or tend to be forgotten? But I think your parents are secure. I think their their work is so strong, but I think it's wonderful that you're willing to come out and talk about them and to make sure that the legacy is remembered as it should be. Yeah, I um, it's <laughs> I'm in the kitchen right now. <laughs> it's the center. We're in the hub of the house. Hi, Henry. Um, I yeah, I, I think that there's um, I, I don't know. It's it's you know, there's the visual. There's they're, they're, you know, the pictures of them, the images are, um, I, 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 I'm trying to think about like young people, younger people, I feel as though maybe that maybe their, their legacy hasn't been stewarded the way it should be. But we're actually, as a family, we're trying to, to counteract that a little bit. We're working in, um, on a documentary oh. about them. And, um, that should be really interesting. And it's being directed by Ethan Hawke, which should be fascinating. Oh, oh good. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, so you're, you're taking part in the family tradition of being an activist in a way. You well, want to yeah. go after it in a way. Well, it's interesting to think that the, you know, I think this story of my, of my parents, um, there's a, there's the fairy tale, you know, of the, the, the perfect, you know, seamless relationship. And people seem to want to really hold on to that fairy tale, even though all the other information is out there. But you have to remember, they were two actors, they were mercurial, and the relationship was mercurial, and it was it was complicated. And there was a lot, you know, there was always a lot going on. And, um, and I think, I used to think it was a good idea to, you know, people need this, this fantasy and this, this simple, you know, they were perfect Hollywood couple. And, 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 um, Everything was so easy, but that's kind of boring. And I think, in light of the fact that um, they are, I feel like they are fading, fading a little bit. Um, that it, now is a good time to just tell the tell the story. It's yes. much more interesting, and it also um, it it also gives my mother a lot more space in the story. But isn't there some reality? to the fantasy of this story, this very long-lived Hollywood marriage, which despite everything and the pressure of careers, did work and did last. Y yes, I think, I, think I think the trajectory of the story that is so fascinating and, and more interesting than this, you know, they, you know, they came together and it, it, was, it, was, all, it was perfect, um, is that 
they came together and it was passionate and there was a lot there were you know there was a lot conspiring against them and there are a lot of reasons why they they could have been torn apart but they were really 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 deeply and inexorably tied together and and that was irrefutable you couldn't they they were um, at the end, I was said at the end of the day, he, she, she was the only one he wanted in the room. And I think that her ace in the hole was that she, he, she knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he respected her as an actress more than any, he found her endlessly fascinating and respected her as an actor, um, more than, you know, more than any other person. So, so the, the, the bond between them was unbreakable despite the fact that it wasn't the fairy tale romance that people yeah, want to hold on to. Yep, yeah, it was it was it was preordained in some other realm, you know, it really I, was like even if they had wanted to, and they did occasionally want to, um, you know, throw in the towel, but they didn't and and they didn't because they just it it's, I mean, that to me is what's so fascinating. It was, like, it was like heart to heart, you know, soul to soul, couldn't be done. As growing up in a household of not one, but two world famous movie stars, how long was it as a youngster before you realized, well, my family really isn't like most families. I sort of was born into a special place. Um, it's a yeah, very a strange feeling to be five years old and know that there's one thing where if you're not, you know, there's, there's a certain thing you can say if you're not getting all the attention. And if you say it, all of a sudden, everybody will turn around. And that was to somehow work, work into the conversation who your parents were. And did, that's did a you very, use that, Melissa? Did you use that? I don't, I, I think, you know, when I was really young, I think I used it. I, di I didn't use it, you know, consciously, but I used it subconsciously. And I think it's been, you know, it's, it's definitely, it is this very, very strange thing. You, you grow up with this weird sense of your own importance, this weird sense of what, you know, the fact of what you have to say is important. And, you know, then you're thrust into the world later as an adult. And, you know, certainly now in my life, um, you know, I, I have to remember that, you know, what I, what I have to say is, no more important than what anyone else has to say. I, I'm not, there's something about, I'm just, I'm just born in the right Petri dish. I always said if I had to have two movie stars for parents, I'm glad I got the ones I got. I think about some of the ones I could have gotten. But, um, you know, but what did- your story's a happy one. After all, many of your contemporaries who had parents as famous as yours don't have a happy story to tell and probably don't want to commemorate their parents' legacy, might be very angry or bitter at their parents as parents. I'm gathering that your parents were reasonably good as parents? Hmm. I don't think anybody, nobody comes, no, li listen, they had two, you know, my father started having children, you know, he was married to Jackie Witt, and they got married young, they had three children, I remember reading an article about my brother, Scott. Um, somebody was doing an interview. Uh, it was in a magazine and they were talking about this, you know, the toddler was having a tantrum in the other room. And, and um, I, I had a kind of a, a difficult and tantrumy baby and, and it's really hard. And I think that, um, I just, I, people were just doing, you know, they were getting married and having babies and doing what you were supposed to do if you were from Ohio and you were dating. And, and so, and then they had all these children. And then, then my father met my mother. And that was, you know, that was probably his, his destiny. Um, but he already had three children. And um, so, and no, and, I think they had, a, you know, as I said, their first baby was a difficult baby. And, and there were, my father said to me once, he said, he was really lovely. He said, you guys are doing such a great job raising your kids. And he said, you know, we just flailed through the whole thing. And I said, well, you didn't have any, like we, we read magazines and books. My husband's an educator, you know, and he was a social worker. He worked at foster care. He always worked with kids. Um, you know, I, I was I was very lucky, but they didn't, you know, say difficult.
family. So we had these three children from this, um, the first marriage. And then, you know, my parents got together and um, that's never easy, but I can only imagine for, for Jackie Witt, who also wanted to be an actor, how hard it was to watch the second family, watch my mother and my father, you know, but my mother also was really great about bringing, um, trying to make a space for us to be a family. And really you all together at any point, all the kids, a lot of the, time. The, the house I'm sitting in right now, my parents bought in 1961 and we bought, bought it from them when my son was two and he's now 24. And, um, my, we were together here every summer. Um, and my mother really made a lot of space to try to bring us together as a family. And my, my, the youngest child from the, from my dad's first marriage was really, really close to my mom. And um, she was, she was close to, she was close to all of them. She loved them all. And it was hard and complicated. And she worked really hard to try to make it happen. She, she made the French toast, you know, I give her a ton of credit. She, you know, she, she, she got up every morning when we were home, she made the, she made the French toast. She always knew where everybody was supposed to go and, and you know she ran she ran a household and it was and were, then were your parents attentive parents when they weren't when they weren't working and were they attentive parents when they were working or was there a difference um i think my dad was a little bit lost with he got better and better with children as time went by um i think he i think he loved us and we all had a great relationship you know with both of my parents, um, they were actors. They were complicated people, and they had a lot of stuff on their mind. And um, I'm trying to remember. We I can remember being very young and having a little bit of living in Beverly Hills, and having a little bit of like you know the the nanny's going to bring you to say goodnight to mummy. But at the same time, I can also remember going into her you know makeup and. My mom was always spray painting furniture. We were, I have wicker furniture with seven layers of spray paint the way everybody did in the sixties and seventies. Um, and we did things together. And, and I have to say he, they were amazing grandparents. <laughs> they were, well, we lived right next to, we lived right across the river from each other because they bought a house for my grandmother. That's right across the river from where I am now. And they moved in there when I moved in here. And so we, we were a tribe. Uh, my parents had these two houses when my grandmother passed away. I always thought it was funny because most movie stars own, you know, an island somewhere, or a house in, you know, in Paris. And my parents had two houses across the river from each other in Westport, Connecticut, and they would move back and forth. <laughs> and my mother always said she didn't know, she could never find her underwear because they were always going back and forth. Occasionally they would rent a house out. Um, and I always knew I would end up here, but this this house was the heart and soul, really, of the family. It was just, you know, this was when, where. When, Ms. Melissa, when you were growing up and your parents' movies came out, did you see the movies? All of them? Did Did you discuss the movies with your parents? Did you have family discussions? This worked. This didn't work. This was a great film. This was disappointing. I loved working with that person. I really didn't care for that person. Was there that kind of discussion in the home? I think later we talked. We talked a lot about movies in general, and we we discussed movies and art. I, you know, as as a young adult, and as an adult, I had a, my. We were super tight. Uh, you know, I had a, a blast with my parents, and there's nobody I would rather be with, or share with, or do anything with than my parents and my husband as well, which was really fun. He was very close to them, so um he would go to concerts with them and we we shared a lot of culture together but one thing i think was really wonderful is um one thing that they gave me is growing up in a house where the and that you know any i'm just going to be a million actors listening to this but understanding so deeply what the process of acting is understanding so deeply what um what it means to be an actor and the alchemy of what actors are doing um, and I, I kind of took it for granted for a really long time. But when I suddenly realized that, you know, when I go to a movie and I watch actors, when I become immersed and when I lose myself, I know that they're doing their job when the acting petticoats aren't showing and, and when it's really seamless, 
And I would rather watch a bad movie with great actors or great, or, 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 or a brave attempt also. Like I love watching actors struggle to make something work. And that's really a gift that my parents, you know, just being with them, listening to them talk about, you know, about theater. Did, and about did, they, did they share the process of creating characters as they were creating them? They it just was part of growing up, yes. And there's, you know, as a famous, you know, when my mother was doing um, the effect of gamma rays on Man of the Moon Marigolds and playing Beatrice Hunsdorfer, which is a horrible, horrible, you know, she's a, it's a terrible, terrible character. I mean, it, you know, heartbreaking, but but kind of dreadful. And man, did she bring that character home? And I'm trying to think, I was had to be about nine or ten or something, and it was a dark time in the house. It was a really, really my mother, it was kind of, there were periods of time when you would come in the house and you would know that like something was, something was up, things weren't right. They weren't, you know, you know, there was some strife in the house. And I always said that when my mother got angry and she could be, you know, my dad would get silent, my mom would get angry. And that I always thought she was so incredibly eloquent when she was angry until I realized that a lot of it, she was quoting Tennessee Williams. <laughs> She would throw these things out and you'd be like, wow, that's such a zinger. And then you'd realize that it was, yeah. It, yeah, they it, should have great, you know, a great, you know, acting vocabulary of encyclopedic. Yeah. Have you seen most of your parents' films? You know, probably surprisingly, I know we talked about this, that ex that I don't think I've ever seen Exodus and that you well, that, that's a loss. You have to see that. It's gonna, it's, uh, it's, it's see that a hundred percent on my list, especially because I married into, you know, a deeply, not a religion, like a culturally Jewish family. So, um, and your father was half Jewish after all, right? He was half Jewish. Yeah. Cause his dad, well, was it, I don't know if his dad was, I think his dad might've been half Jewish. I think he was a quarter. It's in the Adam Sandler song, the Hanukkah song. He talks about my dad. <laughs> um, yeah, he um, and you can you can see that there. It was um, he came from a very intellectual Jewish stock in in um, in Ohio, and that was one thing about his. I think his his mother when she came in wasn't as you know she wasn't quite as educated and i think she always felt a little overwhelmed by his family but his family was really really brilliant really savvy business um really literate you know do you have favorite films of your parents that you care to share with us where you thought the work was really good and full you understood the process and the results are up there on the screen in glorious fashion well, there's the ones that I that I think are brilliant um, acting wise, and then there are the ones that I like. We we had talked about doing a discussion in Westport about um, a new kind of love, but the which I used to show to my kids, and it's such a silly movie. And, and the story about that movie is that my my mother brought the script to my father and. He read it and he said, this is the worst script I've ever read in my life. And my mother threw a tantrum and said, finally, you know, a script where I get to be sexy and beautiful and wear all these different costumes and you, and I've raised your children and I've done all these things for you and you don't want to do it. And he said, I changed my mind. It's the best script I've ever read. And then they did it. And, um, it, and I just loved it for Edith had costumes and, and the whole, you know, it was amazing. And I showed it to my children when they were little. But I watched it recently in light of thinking about doing this discussion and realized like it's so atrociously sexist in a way that like I I can't I can't even I mean I had already said that would it, you'd want to just discuss it in in light of that you know and and just to, to ask the question like is it all right to even watch these movies at this point so there is that. But I would say that as far as their work is concerned, certainly my dad in The Verdict, I think that was probably the movie that he was proudest of. Really? really? Work, yeah. And I think it, it's brilliant. It's so, it's so natural and so, so, you know, seamless. And, um, you know, it, 
uh, it was a beautiful line between his own personal torment and he, it, you know, the way that everything came out in, the, in an actor studio kind of, it didn't, but, it didn't seem effortful. But what about the, the work he's very famous for where he plays sort of anti-heroes and sort of difficult characters like HUD and The Hustler that I think really have held up their beautiful performances. They, he doesn't play likable characters and he, he humanizes those characters. He, he makes it hard to like him, I mean, as the character. And that's interesting that he would choose characters like that and not people that are automatically heroic or at one level. Well, I think he struggled, you know, he struggled with the obvious, you know, when you're, when your art form is, um, if you're an artist, then then your success is subjective. You cannot help it. You're you're you know, and there's always doubt. And I think that for him, um, you, you know, because he was so beautiful, and and all he wanted to do was be a character actor, and he didn't want to play the leading man, which those parts those parts are boring, you know. So I think he tried to to find whatever the studios would let him do that were, you know, that were outside of that. And when you look at the work he did when he was older, he certainly loved to go out on a limb, sometimes yeah. successful, sometimes not. <laughs> but, you know, he really liked to, he liked to dig his, dig his teeth in, into something. But, uh, about, about your father's looks, I have to share this with you. Um, Piper Laurie, who co-starred with your dad and the hustler is a friend of mine. And I've talked to her about that performance. And she said, <laughs> at first it was so difficult to play scenes opposite your father, because I would sit there and look at that face and those eyes, and I would just be struck dumb. I couldn't, I couldn't remember who I was supposed to be playing or what I was supposed to be saying. She said, I had to get over his looks before I could play the role. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, you know, it's funny when I look at pictures of him as a young man, um, you know, I'm, I'm complete, it's, it's stunning. But when I was living with him and, you know, through that, I don't think I was as aware of it. Um, I used to love looking at him as an older man and just think about how incredibly beautiful he was. But my, his cousin, Robert, who was another, just one of those brilliant Ohio cousins, um, sent him a wonderful postcard that had a picture of a Greek bronze on it, they were in Greece, he traveled all over the world. And he said, he said, I didn't know we had relatives in Greece. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but yeah, and, and when I went to Rome and I'm, I was in the Capitoline Museum and looking at all that, I mean, it's, it's, it is, it's insane. It's like, it's like somebody made a chart and filled in all the pieces. And it's funny too, because his brother was a very, very attractive man. My uncle Art, who just recently passed away, Arthur Newman, and, um, you know, very, very handsome. And in any other context would have been considered a very, very handsome man. And the only thing that dimmed his light was, you know, being right next to my father who was, you know, ridiculous. But I mean, that was, that was everybody. But, but you mentioned Melissa being in Rome and we talked about this. Um, your father looks like a classic Roman statue come to life. In the film that he hated, I especially <laughs> agree with him. <laughs> It's one of my favorite folks out there. I love the Silver the Chalice. Silver Chalice. I, think I think it's a beautifully made film. Your father looks like a Roman statue come to life. He's perfectly perfect looking for the part. I he think you're just looking at a little harder to play the role. His dislike for the material sort of infects the movie. And I, I it's not it's not the movie's fault. I think he. he I think he was wrong. I, I think he was, was embarrassed. A beautiful about, part for him. He was embarrassed about showing his legs. He always <laughs> used to say he had chicken legs. Um, yes, we, he used to show that movie and literally we would bang on pots and pans. He would give people, you know, popcorn to throw at the screen and it was like a whole, a whole joke for when, him. You know, when it was first shown on television in Los Angeles, he took out a full page ad in the LA Times and apologized. I disagree. I think it's a beautiful film. Well, it could be, you know, it could be, yeah. I think, you know, uh, from a design standpoint. It's magnificently designed. In Cinemascope, those sets and designs, fabulous. But I think, uh, so I think he, he, you know, he, so he always struggled against this, you know, wanting to be, 
um, wanting to be seen as a real actor. And I think that he had, um, you know, going to the actor's studio, um, he, he spoke about, I remember reading, he gave me the book of Thomas Mann, the story of Tony O'Kroger and just someone who was never fit, was too bohemian to fit in with the, with the sort of straight crowd and too straight to fit in with the bohemian crowd. And I think that was a huge struggle for him. And part of it had to do with the fact that, you know, when he was at the actor's studio with all of these amazing actors who would go out and drink and carouse afterwards. So a lot of the work was done, you know, in the classroom, but then a lot of the networking and, and, uh, and other like art exploration, all of that would happen outside of the classroom. He already had uh, like two children. So he was going, or at least, at least one when he was there. So he was, you know, he'd go to class and he had to go home and figure out ways to, you know, to, to pay the bills. And he was really, uh, he had a really, he always said, I never had trouble making money. I mean, he ran a golf range. He sold encyclopedias door to door, fuller brushes. He was, he said, I never would have had any trouble making money because he was a really hard worker and also had a reputation. The one thing that he did, bring, you know, which kept him going a lot longer than a lot of other people. It's like, he always showed up on time. He always was ready. He had, you know, studied this part. Uh, he worked with a, a well-known young actor when he was older who showed up late one day. And my dad had been in makeup since he was five, you know, since five o'clock and said, he's just said to this actor, he said, you know, the next time you're going to be late, just tell me and I'll sleep in. Or maybe I'll show up, you know, and that was the last time that happened. <laughs> but my dad was always prepared. And I think, you know, for people that might have wanted to hire another actor, um, they knew they could rely on him to, you know, he would be ready. He would do the, he would play the part and he would always be ready, ready to go, you know. So he was, he was, he was a workhorse too. But I think he really, really struggled with this idea that he wasn't the bohemian that he wanted to be. He really wanted to be bohemian. And he really, um, I think he never felt like he attained that. He wasn't that kind of through and through, you know, crazy to the last molecule, you know, a Brando or, or James Dean, those people who are so intrinsically artistic. And I think he always felt like he was working to, to make that happen. And so the whole thing about, um, you know, trying to find parts that, you know, that would allow him to move away from just, he, it was, he had a joke, he said, you know, it's gonna be on his tombstone, here lies Paul Newman who died of failure because his eyes turned brown. <laughs> you but know, so that was- Melissa, did he, did he struggle with a sense of not realizing everything he wanted to? Did he feel that he didn't reach his goals? I almost hear you're saying that. Well, you know, he, what, we, the reason he turned to race car driving, um, it's, I mean, obviously he had, he had financial backing, which, which made a difference. And he started out not being a very good race car driver and he worked his tail off to get good. And he gained the respect of race car drivers, which you can only do by being good at it. You know, and he was, he was humble. And he, and he got better and better. He worked really hard and you win and you lose. So it's totally quantifiable, unlike acting, which is completely subjective. So, um, you know, I think he, uh, did he do everything? I think he wanted to write more. Um, I think he wanted to be more vocally political, which because he was in business, he, he was kind of cur had to curtail that. Um, oh, he was an activist. He did speak up. He was an activist, but I think at some point he had to quash that because of the business, because of the food business. Um, he figured that he could do more with the food business, but it, it, it meant that he had to silence himself. And I think he found that really frustrating. Um, but he decided that it was worth it. But he did a lot of very funny writing and very funny writing in a very particular voice really runs in the family, the way that they, the way that the Newman family, his uncles and, and uh, all the Ohio people, the way his father wrote, the way his uncle wrote, it's a, it's a real voice. It's really, really fascinating. Um, so, and then when he met my mother, um, 
when they were working together, my mother was the bohemian. I mean, she came from down south, but I mean, she knew, she always knew exactly what she wanted to be. She came out of the womb knowing she wanted to be an actor and she just went for it and was laser focused. And- Did you have a different relationship to her craft than your dad did? Or was it the same I think, issue? I think she had, I think she had more natural talent than he did. And I think he realized that. Um, I think, you know, she was so organically, you know, she was, a, she would, she was, um, I think it, it took her a while. I can see them, me personally, I can see them both in their earlier work being a little sticky, or I can see, you know, some habits or places where I don't feel like they're, they're real. But my father just loved watching my mother. He just found her endlessly fascinating in her process. And I think he loved the freedom and the commitment and, you know. Have you, have you seen recently uh, Three Faces of Eve? I haven't watched it recently and I really want to watch it with my kids because I don't think they've ever, they, I, I, I hadn't seen it in a long time. And then I saw it again recently. Yeah. And your mother's work is so solid and centered and so unfussy. It's very clear and direct. It's an extraordinarily difficult part, but she doesn't let the scenes show. It's very simple. It, at least she makes it seem very simple. Yeah. And it goes very deep. It is not tricky at all. You use the word sticky, Ab an absence of that kind of mannerism. Yeah. It's obviously a method trained performance, but the method is erased as she delivers the characters. It's and really she's like mother, they, their, their training was slightly different. I think she, so she was at the neighborhood playhouse working with Sanford Meisner. And I think my dad did more work at the actor's studio. Wasn't your mother at the studio also? She was, she was also, I think. But I, she, she always talked about Sandy Meisner having no faith in her. She, to oh. her. <laughs> she was just a Southern belle and she wouldn't, she, he wasn't sure she would go anywhere. <laughs> when your parents worked together as co-stars or when your father directed your mother, did that present particular problems? Were they competitive in the working relationship? Were they respectful of each other? Do you know? Oh, I think they were just, um, it was a really, it was a real artistic collaboration. And in um, Rachel, Rachel was, you know, that was really a labor of love. Everybody who worked yes. on it, all kinds of amazing, you know, the editor, everybody was, um, people just didn't take a lot of money. There wasn't a lot of money there. People really did that. And I think my dad lamented actually, I remember him working on something later on in his, you know, when he was older and saying, you know, how sad it was that people just came and they did their job and then they, they left and went home and there was none of this sort of, you know, I think when they were making these sort of very handmade artisanal films like Marigolds and, and Rachel Rachel, um, people were just over the barbecuing and everybody was just, they were just all together creating the, this piece of work, this, you know, everybody's head was in it all the time, um, which is really, that's such a beautiful thing. And, you know, I, I know I'm sure it happens now, probably more with indie films too. You know, people are being brought back into that, like let's all get together and make a piece of art. Did they the like story. working together? Did they you, loved working they together. They loved that collaboration. Yes, they did. I think um, I think it was difficult. I think Marigolds, I think my parents, you know, there were times like Marigolds, they may have even been going through a difficult time in their relationship. And my mother was playing this really difficult part. I just remember being very dark times in the house. Hmm. Um, but how, do you remember anything about Glass Menagerie? Because your father directs your mother in a beautiful performance. And that Amanda character is a very hard nut to crack. Famous people like Jessica Tandy and Katherine Hepburn tried and failed. Your mother did it and succeeded. Um, yes, my mother, um, she did it. She did it several, several times. Um, I think she did it at Williamstown. She did it in a bunch of different places. 
And so, um, oh, there's just something I want to remember to mention. I'm writing it down. Um, she, she, there's a beautiful book that Stuart Stern wrote, and I'm sure a lot of people listening knew who Stuart Stern, the screenwriter, was. He wrote um, the screenplay for Rebel Without a Cause, and he was he spent a lot of time in this house. Um, one of my heart and soul people of my life, and my son's middle name is actually Stuart after Stuart, and my middle name is Stuart after Stuart. Oh. Um, but Oh, good Lord, where was I going with that? Oh yeah, Stuart Stern wrote a beautiful book actually about that process of directing or my father directing my mother. Um, I think it's called No Tricks in My Pocket. And that's a really beautiful book about the directorial process, um, watching, uh, directing my mother in the film. And the- oh, Glass Menagerie. Of Glass yeah. Menagerie, yeah. but my mom had done it a bunch of times with Karen Allen and with, um, and with Jimmy Naughton, um, she had done it a couple of times with him. And then um, uh, John, it's odd, odd choice of John Malkovich to play Tom in the film, but very- I thought, it, I thought it worked. Yeah, I did too. I thought I did it, it was surprising, but it worked. He found, he found a really interesting um, inroad there that I thought was pretty fascinating. And Stuart writes about it a lot in the book, so. Did you see your parents uh, in the theater? Did you see um, them on stage? I saw my mom a lot on the stage. Oh, and you did? The, yeah, I was very, very lucky. Um, there were some funny stories. She was doing, oh Lord, what was it? Uh, she was doing something at Circle in the Square. It was like- Candida. Is it with Candida, theater of the round. And I remember her talking about my little sister being in the front row, you know, doing theater in the round. It was so crazy. And my little sister was in the front row and she was wearing white high heels and, and her foot was going back and forth like this. <laughs> My mother was like, really, <laughs> uh, very distracting. Um, uh, so I got to see my mother do a lot of theater, which was amazing. And I think that's the bravest thing in the world. I think it's like jumping off a cliff. When she uh, ran the neighbor, I mean, the, the West Park Country Playhouse, when she and Annie Keefe um, worked together to run the, the West Park Country Playhouse, she, when they, redid the playhouse, which was, you know, it had to be done. It was really an old barn. It literally, leaky old barn, literally, literally could see through the walls. So they had to redo it. And she really focused on trying to make that theater. They kept the balustrades. They kept, they tried to keep as much of it as they could. But one thing she did was she cut out a piece of the stage floor and um, put it in front of the door so that every actor who walks onto the stage steps onto the same piece of flooring that, you know, Lillian Gish and, you know. Uh, wonderful, yeah. 75 years of, of amazing actors. So she was very concerned. So she was always about theater. We were always raised to really have a lot of respect for theater actors. We were, we were basically raised to think that theater acting was real acting. As uh, opposed to movie star again. acting. It, it's a different, it's a different skill. I mean, my parents had a lot of, respect for filmmaking, obviously, but somehow I always felt like theater acting. And so my father was, uh, he was terrified to go um, to go back on the stage. He was- but, I, but didn't he really want to do Our Town? He sort of wanted to, to end his career, near the end of his career, returning to Broadway. Here's how that went down, Our Town. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so my mother, so my mother, they were having, I think they had an argument and my father, my mother was afraid of thunderstorms and she didn't, my dad drove too fast and they car a typical couple, right? And so she had a lot of fears that were really visceral through this in childhood. And, you know, my dad was terrible, drive like a maniac and my mother would tell him to slow down just like everybody else's parents. And um, so he was giving her a hard time. She doesn't like to fly. Too. It was probably had something to do with that. And so she looked at him, she, he was giving her a hard time about not being brave. And she looked at him and said, you haven't been on stage in 30 years. And it was like the gauntlet was thrown down. And so out of that came this agreement. He said, I will go on stage and do our town at, at your playhouse 
if you will do was it Empire Falls, I think. So, and the thing that I remember is, so my dad was terrified. And so he went and did, so he ended up doing Our Town, all this adulation, it moved to Broadway. He got to, you know, uh, you know great write-ups, the whole thing. He felt really proud of himself. Well, my mother was like stuck in upstate New York doing reshoots or, you know, and I thought like this, what, this just doesn't seem fair to me, <laughs> especially television, which is really, you know, the, the end product was great, but it can really be a grind, you know, so I felt like my mother got the short end of the stick, <laughs> but That's that right. really came out of a, that came out of a, but I did also want to say that I used to, uh, I spent a long time volunteering at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility in, uh, in Westchester, and they did a production uh, with my my good friend Judy Katz, who um, did a wonderful documentary about the women at Bedford Hills, um, but they did a production of of Our Town at Bedford Hills, which I think was even better. It's the best production of Our Town I've ever seen in my life because it is a play about regret and about missed opportunity, and when you see it done in a in a max, maximum security prison with very minimal you know, no costumes really to speak of. And it was the most moving production I've ever seen. So shout out to- yes, that. extraordinary. But uh, I, 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 I wanted to say that I saw your father, your father's performance on Broadway and I noticed certain things. It was staged so that when he made his entrance, there was no opportunity for the audience to give him a movie star applause. Yes. He entered very, it was brilliantly staged. There was no way you could applaud. He yeah. just wanted to appear there as the stage manager, not as Paul Newman. Absolutely. And at the end, he did not take a star bow. He took an ensemble bow with the company. Of course. He did not want to play the star at all. He wanted this to be an ensemble performance of a great play. He was an actor, you know, he really was an actor. The movie star thing was an accident and, and it was incidental. And, and um, you know, my parents always just valued actors and acting. And my mother taught, um, she had an acting class in their apartment. Um, uh, Dylan McDermott was in her acting class. Um, Allison Janney was in her acting class. My friend, Allison Mackey, uh, you know, pe uh, my friend Mark Wade, people I, um, she, she, and, you know, people went on to have careers in, in varying aspects of the theater, but she brought a lot of people up and through, and she was a wonderful director, probably her, her failing as a director was that she loved, um, she loved actors so much that she tended to be you know, a little, a little blind, like she was just so unconditionally loving of everything they did. And people did love working for her as a director because she was, it was such a nurturing and beautiful experience. If, if I think if you ask most people, um, Greg Naughton ran the Blue Light Theater, he started the Blue Light Theater and um, that Jimmy Naughton's son and my mother worked with them, but people just really liked working with her. Very, very nurturing. I want to ask you about you. I know a lot of our viewers want to know about you. Was there any pressure on you and your siblings growing up to enter the family trade? I don't think there was any pressure. I think probably all of us naturally toyed with it a little bit. Um, I did a couple of classes with Phil Gushy, who had taught at the Playhouse. My sister Nell, you know, she was in Marigold's. And in and also in Rachel Rachel and we were all in a Rachel Rachel too. I'm in Rachel Rachel in the classroom scene. My little sister is the baby at the very end of the movie. It was a it was a family film. Um, so yeah, I think we all toyed with it a bit. And I became a singer. So and I think the acting class was helpful for that. Um, I think my brother um, Scott toyed with it. And I think you know, being the only male child of of um, you know, of this family was really, really difficult for him. Thinking that he maybe wanted to be an actor was difficult for him. I, I'm really glad that I didn't, you know, choose that that route. You're glad you didn't. Oh yeah, I think I, uh, you know, it's hard enough just 
you know, even singing, if I, there are gigs that I've turned down because if it, if it has to just be, you know, a dog and pony show. Um, I, and I understand, you know, people want to come and see if I'm tone deaf or whatever, but you can <laughs> tell when you look out into the audience, you can see people are sitting there with their arms crossed going, well, let's see what she's got, you know, as child of, you know, rather than just hearing me and I'd rather sing in a corner of a restaurant and have somebody, you know, raise an eyebrow over their chopsticks and say like, hey, she's not bad, you know, that feels more real to me. Um, if you don't want that kind of celebrity that your parents had, that's not for you. No, very celebrity averse. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wouldn't mind being, I wouldn't mind being recognized for my work. I'm an artist, I'm a sculptor. Um, and I, yeah, I definitely wouldn't mind. It, it's just, yeah, it's hard to, I've had some really weird experiences um, where people felt it necessary to point out who my parents were. Um, is, that, is that a burden? Has that been a burden to you in a way? Uh, for people listening to me, I feel like it's, um, listening to the music it's like having people listen to you with cotton in, in their ears like they can't be objective so you're always you know I think you're I think my father was always looking for people to be objective and I think that um I think that um my I think that my you know that we're you know everyone in the family is always looking for objectivity uh, do you have a sense of privacy is privacy important to you um, yes, I'm going to, do you want, I've just got, I've got a child here making oh. food. Are you going to make food? I'll just see if it's okay. <laughs> He's putting something in the microwave. This okay. is real life people. This is real life happening. Okay. There's a bunch of people listening to you put your food in the microwave. <laughs> Sorry, he's like, it's my fault for doing this in the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe now's a good time because we talked about maybe yes. doing a house. We talked about this house is a historic house. It's been in your family since 1961. You grew up yes. there, you're living there still. You want to take us on a little tour of this Westport house. As my, as my son, as my son uh, it, it puts his, okay, um, all right. So we do have the work. You asked me if I have the technology to do this. This is me having the technology. This is me walking around with my computer and hoping that I can show you because we do have the best family photos. Um, um, let me see if I can. Oh, Lord. Can I make that work? Can you see yes. who that is? Yes. So that's my dad with Louis Armstrong. This is actually a very famous picture of my father with. Um, with with um with duke ellington and um duke ellington and louis armstrong so we just you know it's all all the best i'm trying to think we have so many see oh here's the house everybody's probably seen this where's this picture before of my dad swimming in the river in the ice he used to chop holes in the in the um in the ice and he would go swim I, it's just a little hard to, to do this, but I'll show you one thing. Um, this picture of my dad as a cowboy in Ombre, I think. So I had this in my house, this picture. And then I had this picture of my mother. Oh, let's see if I can do it. Can we see that? Am I getting it? Yes. Is that the stripper? It's her in the stripper. Okay. <laughs> so I had, I had, um, I had the, the cowboy picture and the stripper picture in my house and people who didn't know anything about me would come in and they would say, who are those people? And I would say, those are my parents. They were, you know, and so this is the, this is the house. There were a couple of things, a couple of things I wanted to show you. Uh oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Poor Henry. <laughs> I'm just gonna give them a quick, a quick view of the house. All right. So this is this is the, the this is our living room. Like this pretty much looks the same as it. It's all the same furniture. Like that's my dad's, uh, my dad's chair, um, this table, the fireplace. Like everything's pretty much the same as it was. Um, and I just wanted to show everybody a couple of things. Um, this was their, this is, 
their knocker on their door. We never understood why they had two doors. There's, if you look, there's, there's one door and then there's what another door. And, and as children, we were like, why? Why would anyone ever want to have two doors to their bedroom with six children in the house? We just couldn't figure it out. And then here's the their door knocker like this, the kissing couple, which is really sweet. And then this was given to me by Ina Bernstein's, is it back? It's backwards in the video, but this was a sign that they put in front of their house in Beverly Hills. Um, it says, please, they have moved. And that's just because so many people used to come and um, used to come and bother us. And this is another thing that I wanted to show everybody that I can't really see it. This is a beautiful thing that was from, it was from Rachel, Rachel. Somebody had this beautiful drawing and everybody signed, the whole crew signed it. And it says, God created us all as virgins. We hope that you have enjoyed becoming de-virginized as much as we have enjoyed the breakthrough. It was a joy and a labor of love. May our next intercourse be soon. And that was from the crew to my to my dad as um, for Rachel, Rachel. So that's the house tour. All right, want to swap places then? Okay. Melissa, could you show us one of your statues, your sculptures? Oh yeah, sure, my gosh. They're all, they're all over the place. Um, so these are a bunch of hands that are under glass. I don't know if you can see them. Yes. Uh, um, here's, yeah, they show a little better if they're not, yeah. I have, I have, I have a whole dining room table full of work that you can't even, oops, I lost you there. Um, I just made this. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so I make um, I make all kinds of artwork and I paint and do all kinds of things. So okay, there we go. He's, he's uh, you work uh, your your studio is right in the house. You don't have to leave home. Uh, no, I actually go to a school and I do oh. a lot of work. Oh, I work at Silver Mine, which a lot of people might know. People might have remembered uh, anybody in Westport, the Silver Mine Tavern, which they just redid and made it super fancy. But that was a place where actors used to leave New York and they used to tryst with each other, um, including, it wouldn't surprise me, including my parents. <laughs> you, you said before we started that you wanted to talk a minute about how Westport has changed over the years? Um, yes, absolutely. It, it, um, when I was growing up here, we had a tumble down stone wall and, uh, you know, we didn't, there was no fancy fence or there was no, you know, it, um, I, everywhere I look up and down my street, there's these giant gates that open and close and um, people have built these giant stone walls. I'm gonna close the door. <laughs> this is my life. <laughs> um, my husband was teaching fifth grade in the other room all day. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, when we were growing up, people used to drive really slowly by the house. It was the peak of my dad's, um, my dad's fame. And we would come home and we couldn't get in the driveway because cars were driving, you know, three miles an hour. And our favorite thing to do was sit out in front and, and wait for the tourists. And when they would pull up and ask where Paul Newman lived, we would um, give them directions to somewhere far away um, or throw apples at them from the apple tree. We very naughty. And, but we would literally come home and people would be standing on our, our front lawn taking pictures of the house. And we had, there was just, there was a knee high stone wall and there was a big wooden gate that you would have to lift if you closed it at all. And we had a bunch of super friendly dogs that would greet everybody. So, you know, and I look now and I think, oh, these people with their, their big giant gates opening, closing electric gates and you know, we just, we never had that. We were like the Beverly Hillbillies. I moved into this house. We grew up here with pots and pan leaks in front of my, right in front of that bedroom door that I just showed you. There was just always leaks. It was always leaking and there were just pots and pans. Every time it rained, it was like that we were like the Beverly Hillbillies. And, you know, they were actors. They, you know, we, I just thought that was normal. There were, you know, mice inside the walls that would keep you up all night. And the house was, you know, it was funky, but clean and, and, um, 
but that was the way actors, you know, if you had a, your country house or it was, you know, it, now it's the smallest house on the block. Um, it, you you know, have a gate in front? Do you have a big gate and a wall? Barely. Barely? Yeah. I'm not going to, I don't want to say anything, but not really. Not really. And, uh, <laughs> and um, it's probably the last house somebody would choose if they, you know, <laughs> if they, um, but it's just, it's so funny. I li literally, when we first moved in, we found, you know, we finally tore the ceiling open and realized that the pipes were just shot. There was, there's no insulation in the house. It's, you know, I feel more like a docent than a than an actual inhabitant. And when, but, but when people come here, I love showing them around. And there are a lot of, you can find a lot of really amazing pictures um, by some really famous photographers of beautiful pictures of my parents taken in this house. And I'm, that's my living room, you know? And, you know, years and years of Christmases. And now we've got, you know, the third generation. Um, I don't know if my kids will wanna, I don't, I don't think we'll last that long here, but you never know, you know. Okay, I think we want to open it to questions from the house, but before we do that, uh, Melissa, we have to pay tribute to a very special woman who actually brought us together because I wouldn't be talking to you tonight and getting all this wonderful information if it wasn't without our mutual friend, Norma Mossheim, who is an extraordinary woman. She's a programmer and a scheduler and she brings people together and she brought us together. And I think all the people out there would be very grateful to Norma Mossheim for doing that. Isn't and she special? Uh, she's, I, you know, we're, we're instant, instant friends. Um, and I just have to tell, say one more thing. Uh, my parents did love letters together several times and you probably know that. So yeah. most of you probably know the play Love Letters. And so this is a beautiful story. There's a million things that I didn't get to, but um, one thing is also that my my in-laws were like my my husband's parents were communists and and I always thought it was a, it was pretty funny that the communist son married the movie star's daughter. <laughs> I think someone should make a sitcom of that. But the other thing about love letters is that every time my father did that play with my mother and he would get to the letter where she's it's it becomes evident that the that she has died. Um, he would I saw him do it uh, several times he would choke up, it was uncontrollable. He would start choking up like when, as he was approaching it. And I remember going backstage and saying, dad, that was just so incredibly beautiful. That moment when you started, like it was such a genuine emotion and tears and so uncontrollable. And he's like, ah, it was out of hand. I couldn't, you know, and he, he, was, he was really out of control. And I asked um, their friend, Michael Christopher, who directed them once in it. And I said, did that happen in rehearsal? And he said, every single time. Yeah. So on that. on that, on that, Mark, do we have questions? I know we've. I, I have a few. Long time, but yeah. Uh, I have uh, Errol Rappaport asked, did they ever talk about Lee Strasberg and the actor studio? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it was a, a constant topic of discussion, and also that you know the technique and the methods. It was just sort of seamless. Um, I can't remember any, any discussions in particular, but I just remember that, you know, being around people like Stuart Stern and, and having those, you know, people in the house, I think Frank Corsaro was also involved. So we yes. grew up with a lot of, we had, I, there's an amazing picture in this living room of Frank Corsaro, Stuart Stern, my dad and James Costigan, I think, and my mom or something like that, just, um, so yeah, that was definitely part of part of the mix, but I can't remember anything in particular. My mom spoke a lot about the neighborhood playhouse. She was she stayed involved there. So, uh, did they ever talk about John and June Springer? John and June Springer, boy, their names just came up today. A friend of a friend of mine just sent me a picture. That's so strange. She just sent me a picture of the Springers with my parents, and I and I looked at it and I vaguely remember them, but I I was you know I was young, so yeah. But that's very that's interesting that that should come up twice in one day. Uh, Bill asked, uh, "Do you know the name of the film your parents?" Uh, let me say it again. Do you know the name of the film of your parents that ties back to you? Oh yeah. Um, yeah, Paris, well, Paris Blues, 
um, my mother had just had me and um, it, it actually it Paris Blues premiered on my birthday, the day of my birth. There was a rumor that I actually sat in Louis Armstrong's lap when I was a baby. Every time we were in Montmartre, my mother would point and I went and saw the, um, the address and I have postcards from there um, where, that she sent to her mother of, and she would point and say, that's where we conceived you. We conceived you there, they would say out loud to their, with their teenage daughter going like this. But, um, but yeah, so, and I became a jazz singer, so go figure. I, that, is that the one that they're thinking of? I, I yes, wonder. that's it. That's yep, it. yep. I, I'm, and I'm, I love that. And actually, we just did a, a discussion on it. I did with um, Wayne Win Winborn from Rutgers. Uh, uh, we did a Zoom discussion on that. It was great. Jim Brochu, why don't you open your mic and ask your question? Hi, Melissa. This has just been terrific. Um, I, I had the pleasure of meeting your parents uh, many years ago through a lady named Jacqueline Babin, who produced uh, Civil. But uh -oh. uh, yeah. I actually, uh, it's funny that you just mentioned James Costigan. I saw your parents in a play called Baby Want a Kiss. Baby Want a Kiss. I remember the poster. Yeah. It was a very odd play. And, uh, but it was marvelous to see both of them together. Did they ever talk about Baby Want a Kiss, why they chose it or uh, we anything have that, like that? The one thing I remember is that we had the poster in our, poster in our house forever. And you're making me want to like rip the part now that, <laughs> that, you know, it is like, I find things all the time here that freak me out. Um, yeah, we had the poster in the house. They were very close to James Costigan and then there was some sort of a falling out and I don't remember what it was about. And I just looked him up and I guess he became kind of a recluse and then and then passed away, but he was very much in the house. Like we we he was one of the kid, one of the people that was around when I was a young child. It was a very risque play. I want to um, read it now. I wonder it, I, I guess you'd It was kind of about the first thruple. Uh, that Costigan and Newman and uh, Woodward were involved in a thruple, and it was shocking in 1964. I still have the program someplace, but uh, doing uh, research for another project, I just read that both of your parents were at the Actors Studio in 1951 in a class together taught by Martin Ritt. Oh, Marty Ritt was another person that was around the house all the yeah, time. Just, yeah, just read that, but thank um, you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Okay, uh, Linda Emile Burns, why don't you open your mic and ask your question? Linda? All right. We'll oh, well, I just, uh, I was a production assistant on The Hustler, <gasps> which was 1961. Wow. And when my mother came to the Rap party, she was pregnant. Now I realized she must have been pregnant with you. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> How fun is that? Wow, yep, that was me. Um, so wonder, here was, I'm so young at the time, it was George C. Scott, mm -hmm. uh, Jackie Gleason, and your dad. And I was, we would watch, and when he, was on camera, he barely moved his face. And I'm thinking, everybody's at, overacting here. And we'd see the dailies and every movement was something important. He never overacted. It was like a master class. Oh. And I, how nice he was. About 10 years later, I'm on a bus. It was a rain, rain. Your dad gets on the bus and everyone's going, oh my God, it's Paul <laughs> Newman. And I was standing in front of him and I looked at him and he goes, I know you. I said, well, yeah, I worked on The Hustler. And he said, yeah, Linda, I remember you. Wow. you know, I was getting him coffee or he'd say, call Joni and tell her I'll be late. And, but I'm thinking 10 years later, the, the man, his observation and he was so kind and so sweet. And really it was a great experience. I was just, this was my first job and to be on The Hustler. Wow. That's quite the first job. Yeah, so now that I, I saw your mother pregnant with you and now meeting you, it's really amazing. Oh, wow. Yeah. That is, that's really, I, I yeah, that's amazing. I don't, now it's making me want to go back and watch that movie. There's so many, there's not enough time in the day. That's a, that's a great film. HUD is a great film. There are a lot of like, yeah. I don't know, Hot Tin Roof. 
Cat on a Hot Tin Roof is great. I do love, you know, Rachel, Rachel is a really weird. Great. You know, I like sometimes a great notion. That's oh, sort of I, that was me. Look. I was in that. It, it's a very good film. That was, I was, very good. Uh, I got, I got to work in that. That's where I started my bank account. <laughs> uh, Sandy Durrell, why don't you open your mic and ask your question? Okay, sure. Hi, thanks for doing this. It's Hi. really wonderful information and um, be interested in uh, seeing you perform actually. But I remember uh, several years before your dad passed away, I, um, I'm, a, I'm a critic and I was at Joe's Pub um, and I can't recall if it was Jim Norton and his band and your dad came out on stage uh, and he sat down at, was it the drums or did he pick up a horn? I don't remember. Piano, maybe. W what? He might have been a piano. Maybe piano. You yeah, because that was kind of the, unless he was really winging it. Uh, it seemed like he was really winging it and they were all <laughs> grand old time uh so yeah that was a great memory for me the one i'd say the one thing about my um about getting on stage is that you know my dad started the hole in the wall gang camps for kids with life-threatening diseases and now there's the whole serious fun children's network that's all uh, worth looking up the hole in the wall gang camp videos you, you want to look for a reason to be happy um extraordinary but they do these amazing galas and he would he would make a complete fool of himself there are pictures of him in like fairy costumes and like he he didn't mind being a goofball and that made him an amazing grandfather too I have to say I have the most wonderful pictures of him just being so silly with my children and I think kids gave him the opportunity to be you know to be really really goofy so he used to love going up to the camp too and and um there was nothing he wouldn't do up there and one funny camp story is that a kid, this is a show, you know, young kids, they had no idea who he was. They just knew he started the camp. It's a famous story. So there was a lemonade carton there and he's sitting at the lunch table with the kid and the kid looks at him and looks at the lemonade carton and asks him, are you missing? So anybody who knows about like the missing children on the milk cartons. So that is my camp story. <laughs> But yeah, he used to go he like up on the things that he did, the pictures from him being on stage with kids. There was nothing he wouldn't do. It gave him license to be really, really ridiculous. I have uh, several questions and comments here about your singing career. So this might be good to turn over to Foster. Foster. But a lot are asking about the type of music you do, where you're performing, you have yes. your Yes, I was going to ask, Melissa, we would like to know when can we see you? How can we hear you? Are there CDs? Uh, what is your musical focus and specialty? Do you perform I, a lot, or, you, or do you? Do I don't. I don't. I have. A, I have a jazz trio. My friend Tony Lombardozzi and Phil Bowler, and we work together a lot. But mostly restaurants, because again, I've had opportunities. I don't tend to like big spaces. I like to be in a corner making ambient music. I have my Instagram, if anybody wants to follow me and I have my artwork on there is um, Melissa Mud and Music, 1D. Two Ds will get you a porn site, so don't do it. It's <laughs> Melissa, Mud, <laughs> Melissa Mud and Music. And you can look me up on Instagram and when I do sing at a restaurant, I'll post it on there probably uh, or definitely. And um, so that, and I, you know, I. I used to sing, I, I did cabaret for a while. I won like a bistro award like a million trillion years ago. Um, and I moved away from cabaret. So I'm, I really would, you know, I'm a, I'm a good for local jazz singer. Um, when you appear in, in, in Westport or locally, do you appear as Melissa Newman and your, with your, with your trio? And not, yeah. as, not as the daughter of movie stars, as yourself. Well, that would be so silly, Foster, wouldn't it? That would make me crazy. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no, absolutely. I do. I do Melissa Newman. I try not to do a lot of gigs where I, people are just going to be staring at me and see if I have a third eye. You know, I, I, I just want people to come. I, I love gigs where I'm in a restaurant and somebody's toddler is dancing in front of me. Like, that's my favorite kind of gig. <laughs> but I do, have a, I do have a nice little following and people will come and hear me. Um, I would say, like, I'm not, I'm not bad. Like, you wouldn't. If you came to see me, you wouldn't think like, God, why did we do this? <laughs> Can we get to the door without her seeing us? Um, 
it, yeah, I'm going to try to find more gigs. Obviously, now it's it's virtually impossible, and I'm I'm thinking of trying to record something. I've had I've had some opportunities, so. Try and to jazz, play. jazz is your is your particular style. Jazz yeah, is specialty. If I, if I could be a way better jazz singer, I would. I I think I'm. I can improvise over simple changes at medium tempos. Put it that way for anybody who knows music. Um, and I have good phrasing and I used to sing jingles. And one of the things that I got to do is a highlight of my career, but it was like 20 years ago before I knew anything about jazz or knew who anyone was. I got to fly to Japan to do an on camera for Panasonic where they pinned me into a little dress and, I, and put makeup all over me and did my hair. All these women that didn't speak any English at all because it was Japan. Um, and I didn't speak any Japanese, but I flew over there with Hank Jones and Bob Cranshaw on bass. And I forget the really famous drummer. I forget his name. And so I was there with the stellar jazz trio. I had no idea who these people were because I was so young. So Hank Jones is just, you know, if I had known who he was, I would have had a heart attack. So, and he told me, he told me my phrasing was good. I, uh that's important. So there. <laughs> are, were there any, are there any jazz vocalists that you have particularly admired or studied? A, a, a million. Well, I also, I studied, I studied opera with Marlena Malas. People might know her. She taught at Manus and all kinds of, she's been around forever. She's an incredible woman. And, um, uh, oh, in a dream world, like uh, I, I, I would shoot for an Anita O'Day, but I'm probably more of a Julie London. Okay, that that's a good reference. I get that yeah, one. <laughs> yeah, and Ernestine Anderson. I mean, in my in my wildest dreams, I'd be Ernestine Anderson. So there you have it. <laughs> okay, Mark. I think we're probably got, about ready to wind up, unless you have another question. I, I've got two more. I think. Okay. I'm so one is, uh, where is he? Michael Chaut, would you open your mic and, and do your thing? Sure, hi, how are you? Um, hi everybody. I actually was very, very fortunate. Um, I, um, I'm, I'm 61 now and when I was probably, Melissa, when did um, Hole, in the Wall, Hole in the Wall Gang start? Do you know? It's like 30, 30 years ago. Yeah, so I was probably in my late 20s when I was asked to start appearing at the um, events that they had. Yeah. Um, they used to do, um, the first one I did was uh, um, on 57th Street at a, um, oh man, I can't remember the name of the place, but then they started doing them at Tavern on the Green. Yeah, they and, did have uh, things there, yeah. Right, they had these luncheons. And um, at first, for many years, I did walk around magic there in the, Last year I appeared, and by the way, there was this, this is one classic event uh, or day I'll never forget. Your mom wasn't there always when your dad was there, but this one day your mother was there and she, I'm, I'm talking to your father or performing for him and your mother walks up and she says something like, Paul, if we're gonna make the race, you're gonna have to leave now. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm thinking, Here's Joanne Woodward nudging <laughs> Paul Newman. Uh huh. And it was such a great moment to show I'm, that they were just such real nice people. I'm surprised that she was urging him to go to a race because it was not her favorite thing that he did. She said to me once, she said, you know, I married an actor and somehow I ended up married to a race car driver entrepreneur. <laughs> She's like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> Because he really, honestly, he got more into racing, you know, as as time went by. Yeah, this this was in, in the later years. Now, the first time I met your father, one of the things I do, and, and Magda Katz knows me and she knows I do this, I do pickpocketing for entertainment purposes. <laughs> and I, I stole your father's watch. And he was wearing a Swatch watch, by the way, which almost fell off in my hand. I'll never forget. And... Um, the the when I did the reveal and I gave him back the watch, he said to me, "Can you steal other people's watches?" <laughs> and I said, "Yeah." And he and he said, "Come here." And he went in the corner of the room and he said, "Go steal his watch and bring it back to me." And for the next hour, he had me stealing people's watches and bringing them back to him. 
which he thought was the funniest thing in the world. And then he would walk up to them and say, you're missing something and give them back their watch. <laughs> so this, so he took all the credit. This great moment happened now, 11 years later, when um, Jimmy Norton called me and asked me to perform on stage at this last afternoon event that they had um, at Tavern on the Green. And, uh, and I, I did, and afterwards your father, who was always very quiet, uh, walked up to me and he said, I just want to say thank you for, you know, performing today. And I said, well, that's very kind. And he must have said something like, if there's anything that I could ever do for you, because, you know, these were all volunteer events. And, um, and I said, well, as a matter of fact, I, all of these years having met you, I don't have a good photo with you. Would you pose for a photo? And he said, sure. And, um, while we were waiting for the camera, I'm trying to kill the, the dead time. And I said to him, do you remember when we met? And he said, no, remind me. And I and actually I just remember the name of the place was Labar Bat. And oh, I said, yeah. we were at Labar Bat and I met you and I stole your watch and you were wearing a Swatch watch. And I repeated what I just told you. And he, at the moment where he and I were talking and he said, I remember that. And he started to laugh. I started to laugh. My friend arrived with the camera and there's this wonderful photo, which is one of my favorite photos of all my life. Genuine. It's genuine laugh, yeah, of your dad and I. Laughter. He, um, he was a, he was a, he was a, he had this really goofy, goofy, goofy side that people don't know about. And that's why he was so great with children. He was just, he was so silly. And he had just the silliest sense of humor. He was punny it was painful it was he was a typical dad dad kind of a guy he told dad jokes and yeah i you know that's what i miss he he delighted in oh my gosh easter hiding easter eggs when we were kids here he would hide them on a blade of a ceiling fan and you wouldn't find it for six months until you or like you know three months you turn the fan on um and right before he passed away he hid eggs for my kids and he was sitting in a chair and he was very frail. And my kids were running around looking for eggs and, and they couldn't find the last two and they couldn't find the last two. And he just had a smile on, their on his face and they, they came to him and they were like, Pop, Pop, we can't find the last two eggs. And he reached in his pockets and he pulled out the last two eggs. So, and uh, our I, last question, uh, we'll ask uh, Joanna Davis to unmute. She doesn't know how to, can you unmute her? I did, I did, I did. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I have to tell you, um, I'll get so emotional. Your mother was my favorite, favorite actress. I don't believe this. No, bring but, it. I'm, I, I, I feel you and I'm gonna probably start crying too. <laughs> I was a young, uh, I was graduating from high school in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Wow, okay. And that summer, your mother was filming Long Hot Summer, my idol. And I contacted her. She was on a very heavy schedule. I told her I wanted to study acting. I would, as a dancer and all that kind of, I was going to LSU where she went yep. that September. But I wanted to eventually study. So she couldn't get with me because she was getting up at four o'clock and driving to Clinton and everything else. She was so kind. And she said that, um, she said, if you want to be an actress, I said, I don't know to go to California, New York, what? She said, no, do not go to California. You go to New York to the neighborhood playhouse and you study with Sandy Meisner yeah, the greatest teacher of all. And so the I went to LSU that uh, that year, and that summer I went to the neighborhood playhouse. Unfortunately, uh, uh, David Pressman was there that summer. But um, at LSU, I went back to LSU, and I was in a play there. And I just remembered I've been trying to think for four weeks now. The professor, I think it was called Dr. Shaver, but I'm 80 now and I was 
17 years old then. And um, so I was in a play and I said, Dr. Shaver, I am going to New York to study acting. And he said, yes, we have a very famous person that I had in my drama class, <laughs> Joanne Woodward. And when she was here, she said to me, I am going to New York and I am going to be a famous actress and I am going to win an Oscar. <laughs> and guess what? <laughs> and she did. And I must say, I, I went, I, I couldn't stay. I went back to LSU, but my heart was coming to New York. And I wrote her a letter. I was having trouble and I still have a Southern accent with the accent. And she was filming in Paris that movie you were talking about. Yeah, For some good. reason, she got my letter and she wrote me a lovely letter back about how to work with my speech and how hard it was for her. Yes. She was wonderful. I got to meet her uh, when they did the play on Broadway, the two of them. She invited me to the play and invited me backstage. And she had Angela, Angela Lansbury wait while she talked to me. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just how many people know that Joanne Woodward told her professor at LSU that she was going to New York, become a famous actress and win the Oscar. Can I just add to that, that I don't know how many people know this, but she also made her, she's the only person- Made her dress. Made her own dress. Yeah because she didn't have enough money for a dress, only for fabric, on the sewing machine, made the dress, lined green silk and the jacket with the portrait collar. And it was gorgeous. I watched it and I was like, oh my God, I, you know. And if you see her running up the aisle, she's holding the bodice the way one would. If one <laughs> yes, was yes, yes. And Joan Crawford told her she set fashion back a hundred years by making her own dress. <laughs> And then, and yes, I have pictures. And of I bet she, she's the only person that ever did that because she had such yes. confidence in herself. She, um, another woman made a dress out of credit cards, which was really amazing. She was a costume oh. designer, but no other actor has ever actually sewed their own Yes, no. And everybody, I encourage everybody to look it up. It's stunning. And she made clothes. Oh, I, I can still see it now. I can still she made clothes it. for us all the time, too. She yeah. sewed clothes for us. And actually, I'm just in the process of trying to sew uh, re-sew a zipper for my son on a pair of pants because he thought that would be simple and anybody who's tried to put a zipper in. Oh, it's not simple. Yeah, thank I you. I sew too, so it's not <laughs> but I just had to, when Magda told me about this, uh -huh. she knew I was, she just, I just think she's so fabulous. And I, you know, it just was wonderful. But well, I mean, now, we, thank, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. This has been an a fabulous evening and we had so many people that were so eager to talk to you and you you're so generous with your time thank you of course foster great as always and mark putting this together thank you thank you everybody and we will have um hal linden february uh 2nd so watch your email and be sure to visit our website uh, there are links on the email inviting you to these events uh, this video will be posted sometime tomorrow afternoon under recent events. On behalf of the Lambs, first I want to thank our, my fellow Lamb, Foster, for his wonderful hosting as always. Thank you. It was a and, pleasure. And to our guest, Melissa, thank you very much. Foster, do you have any final words? I just want to say it's a very, very cold evening here in the East, and haven't we all been warmed by Melissa? Mm warmth and generosity and genuineness. Isn't she wonderful? <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Melissa. Thank you. Thank uh, we will talk again. You're not getting rid of me. We will continue this discussion. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you all so Thank much. You. Bye, Thank Melissa. You. Take care. Thank you so much.